Hi, everyone. Welcome to Live with CXPA. I am Gabe Smith, CCXP. I'm content manager for CXPA. So whether you are joining us on LinkedIn, whether you're live with us on Facebook, or whether you're live with us on YouTube, or whether you're watching this uh, after the broadcast is over, we're excited to have you with us and to uh, bring you a great conversation today. Uh, this is the first of what will be many regular live streamed uh, events across CXPA social media channels featuring conversations with uh, customer experience leaders around the world. So we're not only going to be highlighting CX success stories that are full of lessons learned for you to think about in your own, or own organizations, but we're also gonna be talking to these leaders about professional development, uh, career advancement, their advice for how you can make sure that you are taking control of your career during these times. So uh, before I introduce our guest today, I wanted to make sure that I shared with you that there are three days left in our new membership promotion. So if you are ready to make an investment in yourself, you're thinking about you know, your own career growth, uh, please make sure to visit us at cxpa.org. You can use code CXDAY20 and receive 20% off the regular price of new membership, which brings it down to 180 US dollars for a yearly membership. Um, CXPA members have access to our networking forum uh, where you can interact with other global members and CX leaders. Uh, you can interact, uh, you can join our mentoring program so that you can find a career mentor or become a mentor yourself. Um, you've also got the ability to share your thought leadership on CXPA's blog and in our weekly global newsletter. So hope that you'll visit us at cxpa.org and check that out. So I uh, wanna introduce our guest for the program today. Our guest is Todd Unker. Todd is the Chief Experience Officer and SVP of Marketing and Member Experience at the American Medical Association. Todd has led digital change initiatives at AOL, Time Inc, and the Daily Racing Forum. Todd is a transformational leader for the digital age with the classic profile of a productive disruptor. He operates at the nexus of digital technology, content, product, developing, development, marketing, and business development. So by bringing these areas together in unison, he's been able to drive record growth in audience, customers, e-commerce revenue, and advertising sales across multiple digital, business, digital businesses. So, so excited to hear about his work with AMA. Uh, so, Todd, Hi, welcome. Gabe. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's good to be here. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Excited to have this conversation. And uh, before we get started, I uh, just wanted to say to our viewers, um, please use the comments section to ask questions. Uh, we'll do our very best to address them where we can uh, during this conversation. So, uh, Todd, uh, wanted to just ask if you could kind of share a little bit of background about yourself. I mean, I, I lo, lo, read, read your bio. Just give us a little bit more background on how did you come to be the leader of the American Medical Association's customer experience program? You mean it's not exactly clear how I moved from horse <laughs> racing to uh, the AMA? Yeah, let's connect right. the dots a little bit. Uh, it is kind of, it's interesting and only in kind of retrospect, but I started my career in consumer marketing and advertising. And that's where, you know, my, my lens uh, is rooted in the customer. And, you know, whether it was at Procter & Gamble or Leo Burnett, that's where I learned about consumer focus and research and listening, positioning, brand strategy. Uh, and then I, uh, uh, because there really was no foundation for people in the internet at that time, when I moved to AOL, I was able to work my way into a product management position. And I think, you know, again, another layer that's so essential to today and understanding how pro digital products get built, how people use them. Uh, defining user requirements. Again, another very user-centric uh, position. And I progressed from there to running a lot of digital sites and a bunch of different arenas, primarily in media before I made you know, my last leap uh, to where, before where I am right now. And even though, you know, horse racing sounds like a whole different world out there, it was an e-commerce business and about yeah. subscription, generation, retention, and connection and leveraging of content uh, into 
uh, data subscriptions. And we had ran a betting platform. So it was, again, how do you generate customers in, a, in the digital age and keep them? And so uh, although the, the context is so incredibly different in healthcare and working you know, in the, the sphere of the AMA, the job in many ways is the same. And it's just a much bigger playing field and, you know, a much more important, I would say, especially right now. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love hearing the background of, you know, CX professionals because it's such a, it's such a varied um, stream. You have, uh, you know, some who come in through products, some who come in through uh, operations or even, you know, customer service and working their way into, into CX role. So love to hear your background. Um, what for our for our global audience? Can you tell us a little bit about the American Medical Association, including who are the customers of the AMA? All right, uh, just to you know, the AMA is the Physicians' Powerful Ally in Patient Care, and those words you know carefully chosen to express you know what we stand for, and that's an important part of the customer experience is setting that expectations. Uh, we have a, a number of different customers. I'm primarily focused, of course, on the million and a half physicians, residents, and students, medical students out there. But we have a number at, at the AMA of non-physician customers, uh, you know, everything from uh, office managers and coding professionals to, of course, uh, the, uh, the government and regulators that we work with uh, to improve healthcare. And, and then the outer rung of that, of course, is about patients. And so we consider that kind of all in our sphere, but in the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I'd probably say uh, physicians would be where I'm, I'm most focused. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That that's great to hear. And so, you know, clearly, you've got this physician focus, and we've had this uh, global pandemic that has impacted every aspect of our life. But I mean, especially that physician audience. So, kind of set the stage for us. What, what as this all started to unfold back in you know February and early March. What were some of the the immediate impacts that you started to see, and how did your team sort of mobilize to 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 bring that customer lens to your response efforts? Oh, well, it's interesting because I've been here now for a little over three and a half years, and you know I would have said the kind of the going in problem that we've been working with over the last three years is about people you know not having necessarily a solid sense of what the AMA does, and so it's been a lot about bringing and building an experience where they are much more connected to our organization and building out uh, the infrastructure, especially the digital platforms to be able to do that. So I would say, you know, having those capabilities uh, uh, in place when this hit, you know, and I'll say, let's, let's call it back in January, when we really started to see this pick up, uh, we began our first reporting about uh, COVID really in, the, in, in late January. And uh, it just started to snowball, obviously, uh, both uh, from abroad and then in terms of the interest in it. And we had to really decide where we were gonna play um, because there's so many things uh, that you could do. But what was clear is that the paradigm that I was operating in and I, my team was operating in had gone from, you know, much more about, you know, informing to how do you prepare physicians, medical students for a life and death situation that's new? And that's a tall order. And we began by really focusing on putting together uh, the resources people need to uh, understand, diagnose, prevent, treat uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus as it was known in those early stages. And so it was a major, major content operation and really beginning to partner closely with uh, all of the uh, different people at the AMA with that coronavirus or COVID-19 lens uh, on it. A lot of the work was already being done in these different areas, health and science, telemedicine, physician wellness, burnout, but then you really needed to take another look and say, how do we focus the energy of this organization to address a life and death problem for our audience? Yeah, now, I love how you described, you know, that that shift from informing to preparing. Um, and, you know, yeah. I, I was gonna say that it, it's an interesting shift that went further because, you know, we spent, uh, you know, let's say we were first kind of four to six weeks, we were just putting so much 
energy into the content, into those resources. And so I, by the time March rolls around, and especially, you know, our organization, like so many people went remote. And, you know, what I started hearing from our customers, our members, uh, was, you know, where's the AMA? We need to hear from you. And I realized that it's not so much just the tangible things. You got to make sure that you're getting those resources into their hands and that they see and feel that you're in their corner, that you're helping them, that you're representing them, and that you're going to get them through this. And that is a very kind of different layer of customer experience than I think I've ever been through, um, you know, beyond the tangible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, well, I can imagine while you're trying to, you know, think about that and how to make that shift and make sure your members feel supported and informed and prepared and all of those things, you're, you mentioned that, you know, you're having some operational impacts to your own organization. So tell me more about, you know, what, what some of the impacts were uh, of, uh, on that. So when you think about, again, back to customer needs, uh, this is, you know, they call it the novel coronavirus. They didn't call it that for nothing. It's new. And yeah. so, uh, you know, you're out there with help, trying to help people who are dealing with something unprecedented. And in, in the meantime, this is having an unprecedented impact on physicians in, in many different ways. And there's a group of physicians that are on the front lines. Uh, that are overwhelmed, like you can't imagine uh, what they're seeing, what they're uh, going through every day, uh, raising the level of visibility around the problems that they're facing with PPE, uh, representing them uh, to people that can do that. On the other hand, you've got a whole other set of physicians whose practices are virtually closed out uh, during this period and are facing real financial impact and real impact with building back the trust of their own patients uh, to take care of themselves uh, during this. So, you know, there are needs all over the place. And I mentioned, you know, we set out, I would say, a very explicit strategy about how we were going to help physicians through this time uh, and students. It's just um, uh, you know, very specific around making sure that they had the scientific basis to treat, diagnose, and deal with this, that we were spotlighting physicians from the front line and sharing uh, the, the learning and knowledge across uh, the country. And third, really removing the obstacles to doing what they need to do. Uh, and you know, that's everything from uh, what they need to get their, their, their practices back up and running to deal with the financial impact to uh, Take telemedicine, which was kind of a thing that was new to folks and kind of slowly rolling out, you know, the jump basically 10 years in two months. Like, How yeah. do you do that? Wow. So uh, there's a lot to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can imagine. And so, you know, you're, you're in this position where, you know, as a chief customer officer, you're helping to uh, guide this strategic response to this novel situation. And obviously, you know, you've got, you've got folks who are helping to execute. So tell me a little bit more about your team and those, the, the execution elements and kind of what, what, how are you working together in, in, uh, during this time? Well, I would say we're really fortunate because, you know, that we say uh, people that succeed or organizations that succeed focus on capabilities and not on, you know, the context at hand. Uh, because you don't know what it's going to be. We didn't enter this year thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to have a pandemic. Uh, so when you think about the underpinnings of the work that goes on at the AMA in terms of the mission, where we are focused on chronic disease, where we're focused on physician wellness, uh, we're focused on innovation. Uh, and uh, you know, those are the things are, are on health equity. Like these problems existed before the pandemic, but boy, did they get worse yeah. uh, when this pandemic hit. And so I'm lucky enough and my team is lucky enough that we work with the leaders uh, in these areas to uh, basically package and distribute what they produce and get that to the people that need it the most. And so that really is the kind of, I'll call you like kind of the, you know, the operation as a whole as we kind of, uh, you know, work very, very closely with all of our subject matter experts, uh, with our members, with our board of trustees uh, to make sure we're meeting the need out there. Um, and that's, you know, really kind of the, the underpinning of it, but it's listening at the core. Yeah. Um, and so that's the most important thing is, boy, yeah, you can produce all you want, but if people aren't seeing it, they're not feeling it, you need to change. And we really had to up 
the level. That's all I can say to achieve that. Yeah, the, I mean, that was going to be my next question: is you know, how did, how did, how did this? I mean, I, I know you you started to hear from your members kind of at the outset and kind of what they needed, and then as this has gone on, um, how have you kind of kept your pulse on the uh, your finger on the pulse of uh, what your members are are needing? And has, it, has that changed over time? Well, that's what I love about uh, you know digital platforms uh, is that you. <laughs> You know, you don't have to like have a focus group. You can yeah. see what they're using. And so, you know, something we didn't have a COVID-19 resource center last year. It's brand new. Now, 5 million people have accessed that. So wow. you can tell in real time uh, what is what matters to people. Uh, so in the kind of usage of the resources that we were producing, that required us to almost have to rebuild our site um, because we were producing so much content in a specific area. How do people access that? Uh, you know, both through the, the site and through search uh, so that they can get what they need. But it also meant, I will tell you, communicating so much more. So we really needed, we just basically turned up the volume from, you know, two to 10 in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, having our president communicating every week, here's what we're doing for you. Here's what you need to know. Here's what you should look at today. How, tell us how we can help and yeah. really show that we were listening. Yeah. And that was an amazing experience. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned your president and, and I think that's a great segue because we, you know, we know that a strong relationship between a customer experience team and the, the senior leadership team of an organization, critical in, in normal times, even more so in a pandemic, even more so in an organization like yours during a pandemic. So tell me about how you made sure that you were aligned with the other members of your senior leadership team. Well, fortunately, you know, these are the greatest people that I've ever worked with. Um, I'll tell you an uh, interesting story. Uh, at that time, our president was Dr. Patrice Harris, and you probably have seen her all over the airwaves because she basically spent 24 seven, you know, talking to the media. Um, but when we, we created something new, it was basically a daily video update to communicate with our, with our members and, and the larger physician community. And let me just tell you, like, we weren't used to doing this. Yeah. And it was rough. And, yeah. uh, you know, all full, full, filled with all sorts of systems that hadn't been worked out yet. Not to mention, like, you know, she can't, couldn't go into a studio. <laughs> like, we're doing this from home. All of the kind of good stuff. And I sent her a note and said, thanks for, you know, basically, you know, working with us on this stuff while we work out the kinks. And she said back to me, people's lives are on the line. None of that matters. Uh, yeah. you know, all these, all these things that the daily obstacles, the, we have one job uh, and that's to help physicians save people. So that's the kind of, you know, dedication and uh, lens through which the people, the senior people that I work with is. And so that has make it a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. And, uh, you know, just, I, I love that, that, that just cuts through it all. You know, it gets to the heart of, of why all this work matters and why the work that you and your team is doing matters so much. So, you know, with that, let's talk about impact because I mean, you, you've already described some of the impacts that your work has had in terms of making sure that physicians are, are confident in getting the information that they need. But are there other stories that you can share? You know, it can be data or just, you know, st stories. Um, that you've collected as you've you've undergone this work uh, that showcases that impact. I mean, we do have, you know, the tangible things uh, that we see every day. You know, I talked to you about how many people have used our COVID resources. Our traffic to our site is three times what it was uh, three years ago. Wow. Um, and we hear back, you know, anecdotally and through data-based, uh, data-driven things like the people are seeing and feeling what we're doing. And you get back comments like, this is the best thing I've ever seen the AMA do in regard to, you know, we do a webinar on vaccine development, uh, you know, or just, you know, thank you. Like you, know, you yeah. see the positive feedback that comes back through all channels on social and through our service center. And it's, you know, it's, it is motivating uh, to see that we're reaching uh, people and that we're helping. So I, I, I also like there have been magic moments along the way that are indicative of 
you know, a very different uh, vision of ourselves and what we do. And uh, one of those stories is uh, like every other graduating, you know, person in college, uh, medical students obviously didn't get to go through their ceremony this year. And we got a request, you know, through our medical student section to do something. Uh, you know, maybe it was some message from our board or whatever to recognize them. And my thought was, why don't we go big? And if there's any a time, you know, in history that we could pull this off, it's right now. And so we produced an hour long tribute to the medical school uh, class of 2020. And it combined oh, wow. the top physicians uh, in the U.S., including, you know, Dr. Fauci, for instance, uh, members of our board, other leaders across healthcare, with, of course, the top fake doctors on television. Uh, and so we put uh, together, you know, this amazing hour of programming that you could see on television that had, you know, an introduction basically, you know, from the cast of Scrubs and uh, three Academy Award winners sprinkled throughout this and a myriad of other celebrities, you know, intermixed wow. with, you know, more serious uh, messages from a number of different surgeons general. But I watched that hour long program and I watched the chat along with it and it was connecting and wow. it changed how we thought about ourselves and what we are capable of doing in terms of what we produce. And it changed minds of people out there when they saw uh, what we were doing for them. Yeah. It's a different, again, it's a different need. It's not something that came out like out of our strategy, like produce right. medical stool tribute. Like uh, it was a creative idea and another example of innovation that can come out of a pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I love it because it's it's an example of how you've not only responded to these these practical and immediate needs, but also these really deep, you know, emotional needs as well. Not just for those who are being honored, but but for for others as well. So I I love it. Um, so we we have one question. Uh, I want to bring it up on the screen here, Todd. Um, Catherine asks, uh, what were the key barriers to overcome to go from a digital channel as a support channel to the primary content channel for your customers? Um, you know, and again, that's that's ongoing. Um, I would say we're in, you know, at the beginning of this three years ago or three and a half years ago, we're in catch up mode. It's not like I had to change consumer behavior to say, hey, you should go online and look for these things. Yeah. Consumers were and, and members, they were already out there. We just weren't there. And so it was a big job. I mean, I've worked at a number of uh, digital publishing operations uh, over the past 20 years. And when we started there, there was, you know, a news operation, but it was not connected in the same way that we think about today uh, to our, you know, our membership and the experience that we needed to create. And so it meant, you know, a wholesale kind of reorganization around this idea of we're going to be a digital publisher like a, any other media operation out there. But our job is different than theirs. It's mm -hmm. not trying to be a hundred million dollar, you know, hundred million uh user thing like the New York Times or Washington Post, we are solely focused, you know, on the million and a half physicians and trying to be in contact with them with more and deliver real value. So yeah. there's a lot along the way and it, you know, relied heavily on the support of our senior leadership at the AMA. I mean, that's why they brought me in. It was yeah. not like, it was like, go do this. Right. The nice thing is you can bring the metrics to bear and say, here's what's happening to our membership. Here, I mean, here's what's happening to our, our audience. Here's how that's translating to membership. Here's how that's translating to our brand metrics. Here's, you know, it, it's just so exciting because your 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 progress is so rapid yeah. in that early time. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment uh, that, you know, Todd, you mentioned physician well-being. So what are some of the things being done to help our frontline physicians during such a trying and ongoing time? So we have a major effort at the AMA that's been in place long before the pandemic about physician wellness. Uh, I don't know if, if you, any of you are unfamiliar with what a physician goes through on a daily basis to try to do what they love to do, which is to make people better. Uh, let me tell you, that's unlike any of the obstacles that you face in your day-to-day -day task. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's say, you know, first of all, does that patient even have, can it, can they, do they have coverage to even come see you? If you prescribe something, can they pay for that? Um, you know, think about like the regulations that govern, you know, physician practice and all of the red tape and bureaucracy 
mm. uh, that starts with, you know, electronic health records and ends with, you know, just trying to get a prescription approved. I mean, right. these are like the, the daily things. So it's no wonder when you look at physicians relative to other similar job types that they suffer from levels of burnout that are really unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And so that is what we're working on. And, you know, our view and what our group works on is it's largely a systemic issue. Uh, it is not because, you know, physicians need to, you know, take time out and relax. Right. Uh, it's not about personal resiliency. These are systemic problems that are built into the practice of medicine that have to be fixed at the root cause. And that's what we work on. Yeah. And so we do research like that determines, for instance, that, you know, for every one hour of patient care, uh, where I'm sitting face to face with, you know, uh, uh, or, or they're sitting face to face with a patient, they're spending two hours on, you know, entering data on a computer, right. including another, you know, hour to two hours at night after they get home. Like, and you wonder, like, how do they do that? Now, layer on a pandemic on top of this. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to really, you know, it's again, it just exacerbates a problem that already exists. Physicians are, they don't see the level of death yeah. uh, and uh, that th this thing brought on in the early yeah. days. And they don't see, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm so glad that you and your mm -hmm. team are, are fighting on behalf of the frontline workers to, to um, try to combat that. And, and speaking of frontline workers, we have a question about your own frontline workers at the AMA. So how did you ensure that your frontline staff were fully motivated and go beyond uh, to meet those needs? So uh, I should ask, you know, when we talk about frontline workers, I mean, we're about a thousand person organization, uh, mainly headquartered in Chicago uh, and uh, uh, and Washington and a number of other offices around. So, you know, we're largely have went remote. Uh, so we don't have necessarily kind of, uh, you know, the medical people. We're not in emergency rooms or anything yeah. like that. But we do have frontline people who are, are you know, essential to continuing to make our oper operation run. And one thing that I just so strongly appreciate about this organization is that along with the time that we were beginning to prepare, you know, our physician and student audiences for dealing with this pandemic, we were preparing about our own employees. And so we were transparent and clear and made it perfectly I guess perfectly clear that the number one priority of this organization was keeping our employees safe. And so that I think, you know, uh, was done through so many different kinds of channels uh, and just the understanding and empathy about people's situations uh, that comes so clearly from, you know, from our, our CEO down to everyone. They understand that is, that's the main issue here is to be safe and to help them make it through this. Yeah. Todd, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm the audience. I'm kind of looking at the comments. We, we got a lot of likes and uh, just, just great comments and people watching from all over the world. Robin watching from Kenya. Great to see you. Um, so Hi, so a lot, yeah, a lot of interest in the topic. And, and I know that one, <laughs> that one thing our um, CX professional global audience is interested in too is you know, just hearing your advice for them as, as they're navigating current challenges in their own organizations, you know, maybe not with the, the the life or death, immediate life or death stakes of the physician audience, but, you know, they're trying to serve their customers as well. So how can they best position their programs for success during this time? I think the number one thing is to have a very clear response strategy that says, explicitly how your organization is going to help. Again, there are a million things you can do, but look at your, your customers, your members, whatever it is, and understand how you, what do they need to truly be helped right now. And so put it down on paper. Uh, and again, don't assume that that's going to happen organically within your organization. It's a it's a leap to go from a brand strategy, if you even have one, to how do you deal with now? How, what's our COVID response strategy? And, yeah. you know, that's the external part. And then there's the internal part, too, to layer on. And those are different people that are working at different things. But what I have found 
is that you know a, a group of us at the AMA and my team is really uh, you know a big part of this is to act as that connective tissue across the organization to unify all the streams of what people are doing uh, into one coherent message that says what we're going to do to help. Yeah. And don't assume that anybody internally knows that or what they know externally and then adapt. So I, you know, we've really used this as a launching pad for trying a lot of new things and we can see pretty rapidly whether that's meaningful or not. And yeah. CX as connective tissue, you know, I, I, I love that. I mean, our, our, our members and CX professionals, I think uh, that's always a goal. Some some days that's easier to accomplish than others and pandemic really stressful. And it's so heartening to hear that you all have really accomplished that. Um, one comment that we received, I'm trying to find it now, uh, is, is need to hear how your own career journey has mirrored the development of the CX field from marketing to a broader holistic approach. So I wanted to just spend some time talking a little bit about professional development and you know, hear what advice you may have for others who are seeking to grow their CX careers or move into a CX leadership or chief customer officer type role. Well, this is very funny. And, uh, when, I, when I first got this title of chief experience officer, I'm not above actually Googling it and finding out to make sure what the heck it is uh, so that I can deliver because no one else knew what it was either. And what I found was pretty interesting. There wasn't a great definition. And uh, you know what you find that uh, experience is kind of a growing uh, concept, especially the holistic way. But you know there there are uh, there are definitions that grow out of customer service. There are, there are definitions that grow out of design. But there's not one that I think is. Uh, up to what I would call experience in the digital age represents. So I had to actually create my own definition. And then I put it out on my third anniversary at the AMA on LinkedIn and ask like, does this work for you all? Because <laughs> yeah. um, I, need, I need something to be a North Star for our, our CX operation. And what I said was, it is the seamless integration of product and marketing and commerce uh, community and service to acquire and retain customers. Yeah, and there's it, a lot in there. You you talked about connective tissue, and you talked about that holistic. The question that came uh, about the holistic nature. That's a different conception, I think, of customer experience, and one that I see on you know on your uh, in your content that is rising to the top. And yeah. Absolutely, you know, and I know you, you you mentioned that sort of lack of consistent consensus definition, and that's certainly something that we've been working on over the past year. Um, we created a, a website, uh, whatiscx.com, to try to address just that concern that you mentioned. So, no, I'm 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 really glad that that you uh, that you brought that up. So, um, and uh, you know, we also uh, have been working on a definition of what is a CX professional because defining the field is great. We also need to define who we are. And so uh, there's our definition of a CX professional as a catalyst who enhances an organization's results by understanding, designing, and improving experiences across the entire customer relationship. And I've personally found this conversation validating of that definition mm -hmm. because it's so clear about the work that you've done to, uh, to make that happen. Yeah, experience is a, tr again, it's a tricky topic and to try to explain it to somebody in the organization because it's not, you know, you can't touch that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, right. you know, I know what I always said, like people, when I was a chief digital officer in a prior role, again, people don't really understand what that was either. Um, and they would ask me questions about like, what's digital transformation? And I would say, well, or what have you learned about it? And I'd say, the first thing is don't talk about digital transformation because no one understands what that is. And you can talk about that kind of in retrospect right? after you've achieved something, but like it's too nebulous. Yeah. And so a lot of like ways that when we work on customer experience, it's about solving problems and about thinking of the connectedness of, of a user's experience with your organization, which starts with marketing and what you say you are and whether you mm -hmm. measure up to that. And through that, I call it like the tornado funnel is what it is right now, which is like, you know, we used to like proceed sequentially through the marketing <laughs> funnel and those, those, right. those, those old days. Right. Um, and now it's like, you have about 10 seconds to go from like, I have an idea, I need something to, 
you know, coming out the other end of whatever that commerce funnel is. It's yeah. so connected. Yeah. And, and this message is resonating. I'm seeing uh, we've got viewers from Nigeria, Brazil, Senegal, South Africa, UK, um, all over the world. So there's glo global resonance here. That's great to see. Um, Gabe, I was going to say one of the key things, too, is yeah. I think largely many organizations are unprepared for that connectedness. And you think about uh, the disconnectedness of those operations and how to, who oversees like that kind of thing. Right. It's new. It is really new because uh, that paradigm is relatively new. Yeah. And, and also, you know, I'm thinking too, you know, it, it can be challenging to serve as that connector and that aligner in normal times. But now you're in situations where many people are not able to pop into the office of that person who works over here in this department to talk about how to achieve alignment. So how do you, how do you overcome that? Is that something uh, that you all have been working through as well? I could, I'd say that's probably been the biggest shocker to me out of this whole thing. Uh, I would say I was a skeptic on work from home. And I think, you know, this has really turned me around 180 degrees on that. Um, but it's really been the support, the underlying infrastructure that's enabled it through communication like this. Uh, you know, we use Microsoft Teams, everybody use Zoom, whatever it is. Like that went from zero to 100%. And I would say, you know, it took about two weeks to adjust to what that looked like. Um, but the productivity of my team is unparalleled. And the main thing, again, I think about connective tissue, that's a lot of what, you know, uh, the senior leaders at the organization, my organization, and what I do every day is about keeping us connected. And uh, that's been a big part of the job for the past seven yeah. months. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Todd, this has been a, a, an amazing conversation. Any final words for the, uh, the global community? I think, you know, again, we're in a new paradigm. And what makes sense right now is for you to define customer experience in terms that make sense for your organization, that grow out of your overarching brand strategies and that solve real problems for people. Experience is not a thing about people just feeling good about your brand. It's about growth. And, you know, when I see and I hear people talk about like how they define the metrics of it, that's been a big impediment to moving experience forward. You need to be also connecting it to growth. Uh, and that means, you know, more customers and retaining more customers uh, as part of the efforts that you put into the experience. Yeah, connecting CX to growth, uh, something we all need to strive to do. Todd Unger is uh, Chief Experience Officer and SVP of Marketing and Member Experience at the American Medical Association. Todd, thank you so much for joining us today to tell uh, the story of CX at the American Medical Association. Pleasure. Thanks Appreciate for having you. me again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, folks, um, wanted to uh, just conclude today's conversation, um, encourage you to take advantage of the, uh, the membership promotion that I mentioned at the top of the show. Uh, you can join us at cxpa.org by October 31st. You've got a few more days left to get 20% off new individual membership. Uh, use code CXDAY20. Also wanted to mention uh, that we've recently opened uh, and accepting nominations for CXPA's Emerging Leader Award. Uh, so the Emerging Leader Award is a new award that is designed to honor the efforts of those professionals who may be newer to the CX field, but are making a tremendous impact. So if you are interested in learning more about the uh, Emerging Leader Award, um, check us out at cxpa.org. And I'm gonna show you just a little bit of a video about the uh, Emerging Leader Award to take us out. Have a great day, everyone. Hello, CXPA community. I'm Desiree Madison Biggs, former chair of our association's board and current member. Over the course of this year, a small team of us have been in the process of creating a new program to expand our ability to recognize and develop outstanding talent in the customer experience field. I'm delighted to announce the Customer Experience Emerging Leader Award Program. 
This program is intended to identify, recognize, and support the professional development of practitioners who are new and are viewed as tomorrow's leaders based on what they're accomplishing today. Why this new program? Because building our community and enabling a strong and thriving discipline is an important focus for us as an association. We currently are able to recognize and reward individuals for innovation and impact, which tend to go to senior or experienced members of the community. What's unique about this award program is that it will be much more than recognition. There will be a developmental component designed to nurture and support these high achieving individuals as they continue on their CX journey. So who is an emerging leader? Well, you know who these individuals are. You may even be one yourself. An emerging leader is defined as an individual who is new to CX, desires a career in the field, and is growing skills in the profession. The five winners of this award are up and coming individuals who are creating better customer experiences for their organizations through new and innovative approaches, methods, and design thinking processes. They're impacting their organizations by leading the initiative or work streams within it, or by bringing proven innovation that solves a problem for their business or for benefits for the overall CX community. These individuals are the hidden gems within our profession that quietly go about their work and produce outstanding results for their brands and customers. So how will these emerging leaders be recognized? Well, first, they're on a CX path because they are a natural, and they're often found advocating for beneficial change for their customers' experiences. Second, they're learning about and are passionate about the practice. Third, they're active in the CXPA community, building their skills, knowledge, and competencies and working towards CCXP certification. Finally, within their organizations, they have made contributions both tangible and intangible that provide demonstrable and or measurable impact. So stay tuned for more information on how to apply through the CXPA website and good luck.